All right, Richie. Uh, grateful to have you on the podcast. Thank you for taking the time. I know you're a busy guy, pro player, coach. Um, so, yeah, man, if you could just introduce yourself real quick to the audience, you know, your name, where you're originally from, your position, your age, and where you're currently playing. Yeah, so thanks for having me as well, brother. Uh, pleasure, pleasure getting to chat with you and, uh, and, and your audience. So, uh, yeah, my name is Richard Dixon. Uh, I'm originally from Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica, moved to the U.S. when I was uh, 16 and, you know, finished high school here, did all my college here uh, in Florida. And then I've been kind of bouncing around the U.S. as a professional uh, ever since college, man. You know, I'm in my 10th season as a pro, currently playing with Chattanooga Football Club um, in NISA, third year in the U.S. Soccer Pyramid. Um, yeah, 32 years old and um, looking to have a few more good years, um, you know, before, before obviously, you know, nature calls. So, yeah, uh, I uh, pretty much can play anywhere across the back. And uh, in, in midfield, I play primarily as a six. But, yeah, center back, outside back, I've played most of my career and uh, as a six. Nice, man. Yeah. Nice. And uh, you're captaining the side, aren't you? Y yes, correct. Oh, awesome. Good to see. Yeah. So if you could just take us through, you know, kind of your development, um, where you started playing um, and then where you played college and then we could go through your pro journey a bit. Yeah. So my development, I would say my development pathways is uh, it's, it's a lot different. It looks a lot different than what most people, you know, would consider the traditional American development pathway would be it's obviously changed a lot now over the years with academy you know and uh, mls academy coming in mm. we have now mls next you know that 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 so it, it's changed a whole lot so my pathway you know grew up in jamaica it was just playing playing football man as much as i as much as i could you know mm. um when i was a, a young boy i would try as much as i can to to, to play with the older guys and with the adults, you know, come home, finish my schoolwork, throw the backpack away, grab the ball. Me and my friends would quickly run to the field to see if we could get there early to sneak in with the adults, right? Yeah. Every now and then we would get a game, and most times we wouldn't. But as you kind of develop and you try to figure yourself out, you know, you start to get better as a player. The adults start to have more confidence in you, and they, you know, they first you gotta you gotta go in the goal, then you gotta work your way out on the field, you know, as a defender, and then as you show, you progress. So that was kind of my development in Jamaica, you know. That's kind of how I fell in love with the game. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, just just uh, schoolboy football, um, the Costa Cup, and had some national team um, call-ups in it for the youth program. Mm -hmm. And then I migrated to the U.S. at 16. So kind of, you know, blank slate, so to speak, trying to figure everything out with the culture, with the, the style of play, with everything. And so, you know, in my family, there's not many athletes, especially footballers. So I kind of had to figure everything out by myself at that time. Finally got on a club team down in, 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 in West Palm Beach, Florida, a uh, travel team. And so played two years there, played high school there, did well, right? But not, nothing special, nothing too crazy. And um, me not knowing the culture, about to finish high school now and not knowing that you, you know, in that whole process, I was supposed to be looking at schools, right. Looking for scholarships and all this stuff. Cause I mean, I, we don't have that in Jamaica. Yeah. Um, you know, it's you, you go schoolboy football and it's either you go straight to the pros or you go straight to the workforce. Right. So college wasn't even a thing that was on my mind. Obviously I wanted to go to study, but didn't even know how the whole process worked. Um, so yeah, just last minute, when I'm about to finish my senior year in, in, in high school, just kind of went online and emailed about, about I would say about 50 coaches, you know, just all the, the, the addresses that I could gather, email addresses and phone number. I just sent like just email to a bunch of coaches, you know, and some of them replied, some didn't. Um, and then it just so happened that one of them that replied, they were having a, a ID camp uh, like 30 minutes from where, I lived at the time, and so I just, you know, went to the ID camp. Say, yeah, just come in. We'll have a look at you, and we'll we'll talk from there. Mm -hmm. Went into the ID camp, and luckily, I was I was, you know, on top of my my, my training. Mm -hmm. So 
I went in, tore it up, and uh, he was like, all right, well, let's come up and have, uh, let's come visit the school and kind of just take a look around, see what you like, and so on and so forth. So long story short, went up, uh, didn't get offered a whole lot, you know, got offered $1,000 for books, man. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was an opportunity, right? I wanted to, I wanted to, to, to first of all, to, to, to continue studying, and then I wanted to continue playing ball, man. So I was like, hey, it's an opportunity for me to go in and at, at least earn something more. So went in freshman year, had a great season. Um, sophomore year, got my scholarship up to a full ride scholarship, right? So got everything paid for right after that, and finished uh, now four years of college and just kind of like where I was in high school, not knowing how the system worked. Obviously, you know, being in the college system by that time, you know, okay, guys are getting drafted MLS, blah, blah, blah. Um, but at that time, I went to a D2 school, man. And at that time, nobody gets drafted from D2, right? Guys mm -hmm. are lucky if they even get a trial for a USL team at that time. So um, obviously wanted to, to, to pursue playing at a higher level, at the pro level, but just didn't know, really know how to get there. And so luckily at the time, uh, I had played for a coach I had played against the coach, right, in college who had taken an assistant job at an at a expansion USL team. Nice. And so he invited me to invite only. Uh, I got invited to invite only trial. And luckily, again, on top of my training, right, I didn't know, I didn't know this opportunity was going to come, but I knew I wanted to continue playing pro. And same thing again, getting a hold of all the email addresses and phone numbers I could, sending out, knocking on doors. But then this one came. Went down there, two-day combine, and um, the coach at the end of the second day just came up. He was straight up. He said, listen, I mean, you are the best player out here. Um, I want you to promise me you're not going to go to any tri any more trials and you're not going to uh, accept any other offers. You'll have a contract in the mail, uh, in the email on Monday. And wow. this was on, uh, yeah, this was on Sunday, like Sunday, midday after the combine. So... Mm. Yeah, went down there uh, to Tampa, VSI Tampa Bay FC for my first season as a pro. And it's been a long story, man. So I'm going to end it there. But the rest is history, you know, just kind of carrying on since. So I'm in my 10th season currently as, as a pro. Unreal, bro. That's a, that's a great city to start off, you know, Tampa, yeah. Florida. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. I definitely enjoyed it. I mean, when I moved to the U.S., I moved to West Palm Beach and I went to school in Pensacola, Florida. Mm. So kind of at that time, my whole life was in Florida. I have a lot of family down there. And so having the opportunity to uh, stay in Florida, I was like, yeah, for sure. Let's do it. You know, I get to play and I get to stay close to family. Mm. <laughs> I didn't At that time, I didn't care how much I was making. Right. I just the opportunity to play, man, and, and stay close to family was all I, I needed. I was grateful for that. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you said a couple. You said you know a couple of great things there. Um, obviously, great journey, but um, you know, you said multiple times. You said two things. You know, um, that you know you wanted to take out any opportunity you could get. That was first in the college game, and then in the pro game, and then also that you were you were staying on top of your training. You know, those two things are huge. You know, right. so um, like you said, obviously now you know. Um, there are more like of these mentorship programs to get into college more, you know, maybe advisement uh, on how to play professionally. Um, but uh, you know, how did you kind of like, how did you develop that mindset of, you know, you, you'll take whatever opportunity you can get and you're willing to network and reach out to as many people as possible because it's, it's, you know, it's a easy to say that, but taking that action it's not easy, you know. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think for me, it came back, I would say, just a little bit from from my upbringing, you know, and and, and just kind of the environments that I grew up in, um, you know, didn't grow up with much like, like most of us, man, you know, didn't grow up with much. And uh, for me, that mindset started when I when I when I fell in love with the game. Right. And that's something that I probably skipped over. Um, I fell in love with the game when I was 12 years old. Mm. When I was 12, I was like, all right, say again? When did you start playing? I started playing, I mean, probably like around six. 
Okay. Right. Okay. But it was, you know, just a little kick around in the park and this and that. Nothing competitive. Just playing with friends, you know, playing little local community. Uh, uh, I would say it would be the equivalent of rec, rec soccer, right, here in the U.S. So just kind of started out doing that at the age of six. In Jamaica, there's not a really good grassroots program. So there's no, you know, big academies and stuff like that. So it was just you find a ball, you go set up some some goals with shoes or you pull some grassroots up, you put them in the streets and you kick it with friends, man. And so that's how I grew up playing um, around five, six. But then as I was turning 12, going into high school in Jamaica, that's when, you know, you start to really get competitive. So that's when I was like, man, I really want to take this thing serious. And it was uh, my mom took me to go watch our so schoolboy football in Jamaica is massive. You go to a schoolboy football game, there's 5,000 to 10,000 fans just sitting there, right? And and these kids, so we start high school in seventh grade and end in 11th grade. So yeah. you could look, you're looking at probably like anywhere from 14 to 18 year old, right? Kids just like with 10,000 fans, you know, watching them. So my mom took me to go watch the school that I ended up going to, to go watch uh, the final. They were playing in the, in the, in the championship game. Mm. It was like 10,000 fans there, you know, and I, I, I I went, I was looking around, I was like, holy crap, like, this is massive, yeah. right? This is massive. And there's kids that are not far from my age on the field. And it was at that moment when it, I kind of started to get the itch, right? Started to get the itch. And then as I was doing my registration and everything to go uh, into high school uh, at 11, turning 12, you know, I went to one of the training sessions of the team and just seeing the guys train and how those guys, man, took it serious and how guys kind of... We're just doing their thing, man, just enjoying the beautiful game, but at, at a different level than I had ever seen it before. And it was at that moment that I was like, yeah, man, I think I think this is it, right? I want to do this. And so went to the tryout, made the team, and I was never a great footballer, right? Was never a great footballer growing up. I was just always the hard kid, just hard-nosed, um, you know, explained and defending, you know, always hard-nosed, not overly technical, um, tactically, yeah. I understood the game, right, yeah, for the most part. But the little nuances, I, I, we didn't worry about those things, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, it was when I started taking it seriously at age 12, and I decided, man, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Like, this, this, this feels good. Everything feels right here. I feel like I'm in my zone. I'm in my element. I'm doing what I love. Yes. And it was at that moment that I decided I want to play football. And so I think that's where the mindset started. Like I wanted to do everything to make sure that I gave myself the best chance to succeed. Right. And I think it's a lot of players struggle with that. Right. We don't necessarily want to think that we're not good at certain things. Right. And we live in that denial phase and we end up don't making progress because we don't, we don't accept it. But in the beginning, I knew I, I knew I wasn't a, a, a great footballer. Right. I knew I wasn't great technically. I knew I needed to understand the game more tactically. And so I was always grinding to, to be better, right? To be a better passer, to, 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 to be, a, you know, have better long balls. Yes. You know, I was always, you know, wanted to be fitter. I was always wanted to be the fittest guy on the team from a very young age, you know? And so I always, always worked on, on those things. And as far as the, the reaching out and, 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 and knocking on doors part of it, it's just being resourceful, man. That's how I was, I was raised, you know, just, you just got to make the best of what you have. And if you don't have it, you got to just go out there and try to find it, you know? And so that, that explains, explain uh -huh. that. Yeah. I mean, you know, it says it all. And, and I think, like you said, I think the number one key is being able to accurately self-analyze yourself as a player. Huge. And as a person, you know, um, and, and, and that's done through multiple avenues. You know, first thing, I think one of the best things is game analysis, really looking at yourself because it, it, it tells you the truth. There's no lying there. Like if, if you didn't track your man on, on the counterattack, uh, you gave a couple bad passes away or your strengths, you know, and I think yeah. it's big, you know, um, personally, as I get older, learn from more people, I, you know, I think it's, it's about really capitalizing on those strengths and really trying to keep those mistakes to a minimum. Um, I think that's one of the biggest cheat codes, man. You know, like if for me as a player, when I think back, to being a younger player, even say, go back to college, right? If I had paid enough, if I'd paid more attention to the film 
you know, when I was, you know, freshman, sophomore in college, I would be, I would have been such a, a better player, you know, because in college you have the time, you know, I mean, yeah, you have class and stuff like that, but you have the time, man, to go out there and watch film. Okay. Well, I'm not good in tight situations, right. As a fullback to open up under pressure to find my 10 or my nine or my, you know, like different things like that. You, the video doesn't lie because it's right there. So I think yeah. that's one of the biggest cheat code, man, like in today's, in today's era of football. Yeah. And then especially with all this stuff nowadays, you got that VO camera, you got your games film, you got Instat, all these things that, and, and then I think it's about what I wanted to ask you next, but it's about like figuring out what you're, you're doing quote poorly and really hammering that on the training ground. So for example, like you said, if you're a right back and you're having tr trouble opening up to that right foot under pressure and, and paying a ball, you, you get, you become friends with your center back and you just tell him, you know, after the training, man, can you just ping me like 30 balls? Let me take that touch and like put that, you know, put the ball nicely into a couple, whether your teammates are out there, or you, you create a couple of zones or targets, and then you're looking mm -hmm. to play the ball into there. And that's quote um, game realistic training. Cause you know, everyone asks for that nowadays and it's, people don't realize it's about the basics, you know? So yeah. You just what actions are you doing every single match? You know, what are you doing well? What are you doing poorly? What are the best right backs in the world doing well that you're either doing or not doing? How can you make it better? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to ask you, like you, you said, you know, twice that you stayed on top of your training. And I think that's that's the base of everything. Staying on top of the fitness, the technical, the tactical, the mental. So how did you do that? Uh, as an individual, because, you know, nowadays, yeah, we have opportunities to train with teams. Some people have, you know, may not be in the right environment, but how can we make that environment uh, as optimal as possible? You know? Right. Yeah. So I think, man, it's just like you said, you know, fil film, film, film is there and it, it's about doing simple things. And this is how I like to put it. Um, when I was uh, my first season as a pro, and I haven't even told my journey as a pro yet, right? It's I just started the first bit. So my first season as a pro, one of the best pieces of advice I got from, from from a coach that I, you know, went implemented for the rest of, you know, my career at then on and helped me tremendously. You know, he told me, if you do these things, right, you could take your game, right, to the next level. Work on... Going forward, right, like I said, I was never a technical player. Um, and even still, 32-year-old pro, 10 years in the game, and I'm still every day, you know, thinking and working on those things. He told me, if you work on your decision-making, right, it will make the game so much easier for you. And what does that mean? It means work on your pass selection and your pass completion. That's it, right? So meaning, playing as a right back, I'm not going to receive the ball and – you know, nine times out of 10, try to ping it to the, to, to, to the left winger. You know, that's a poor pass selection. You know, I might connect it. I might connect it. Might be a great ball, but how many times am I going to set that guy up for success? Right? How many times is he going to be 1v3? When we think about the game, ball swings to your right back, everybody shifts over, right? Maybe you can keep it a little bit and then you ping it over there and the next closest teammate to him is 50 yards. So that's a poor pass selection, right? And then you pass completion, right? So what passes can you complete, right? Most, most. So for me, as a right back, bomb, first thing I do, I get it. I'm trying to get it to the next guy, right? That's in a, in a more dangerous area. So maybe sometimes it's my, it's my right winger. Maybe sometimes it's my 10. Maybe it's my nine, right? Maybe it's my six. And that's where the decision make, making comes down, right? Because you got obviously reading the game and, and pressure, space, timing, and everything like that. So he told me that, and it didn't really come register to me until maybe like a few months after and, you know, going back watching film. And I'm like, man, every time I get the ball, I feel like I'm just always under so much stress because I would just be playing negative all the time because I would never, my body position was always off. So the ball is coming from my, my right center back. My hips would always be facing him and just him. I would never be opening up where I'm seeing the game, right? I'm seeing my six, I see my 10, see my nine. And so for me to turn, I would have to turn all the way. By the time I turn, I already have pressure. And so 
it was a few months after it started clicking. And so after that, going into the off season, what I did, I just I just grabbed a friend, man, and came out and said, just, hey, just be my right center back. Just ping me some balls, right? Lower in the pitch. Fix my body positions. And what I did, I just set up cones, right? Set up little gates as my six. Set up little gates as my 10, a little higher. Set up little gates as my nine, higher. And then, you know, on my line, maybe a little bit inside, set up little gates as my right winger. Mm. And just ping them to ping it to me. I would take my first touch, open up, and I'm trying to complete those pass. Because in the game, realistically, those are going to be my pass selections, right? So I'm trying to complete those pass as quickly as I can. Obviously, with no pressure, it, 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 you know, you have two people. And then we move a little bit higher. All right, be my six. You know, now ball comes from my six. I'm hitting my seven, my nine, and my ten, so on and so forth. You know, and it's it, that's kind of how I approached it. You know, it, it's, just, it's just trying to pick, break your game down, break your dissect it, break it down, and see. Okay, where am I strong? Where can I use improvement? And where am I weak? And yeah. if you look at that pot right there, you can use you as a pro man. You should be improving in all three, even where you're strong. Exactly. You should be always trying to improve all three of those spots. And so for me, it was just like, just the constant day daily, uh, the daily mindset of doing the simple things, but doing them well, right? Doing the simple things, doing them well, and then doing them consistently. And that, that for me, it, it took my game to a whole nother level because now I was more aware, right? Now we've seen the game more. Now I wasn't checking to the center back with my hips and my back pretty much facing the game. I was seeing the whole game. So pressure came. Okay, I knew I could bounce it in there, wall pass, get it on the other side. No, I'm in 1v1 with their fullback, right? So now I go from playing negative to the next season. I'm all the way in the other 18, whipping and crosses, right? Getting assists, threatening goal, and so on and so forth. So I think it just all starts with dissecting your game. And just, you know, don't don't drop the ego, dissect your game, say, man, I'm weak at this, I'm making mistakes here, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. So that's how I look at it. But it's also just a mindset thing, right? It's just being honest with yourself. 100%. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's being mindful and it's being aware. And once you're aware, you can you can actually fix things. If, if you're unaware and you got too much of an ego, there's no room for, for improvement. It's about that growth mindset, you know? Right. So, yeah, if you could take us, you know, real quick through your college journey. Um, were you playing as a right back as well in college? So that's the interesting part about my journey now, uh, Rich, man. Uh, Rick, I, I... Oh, you played as a striker. <laughs> I, no, I played as a six, right? Okay. Entirely as a six. My, my all four years, probably every single game as a six. Mm. But I, I was kind of given a free roll, right? Like a box-to-box midfielder. I was started as a six, but I was given the freedom to roam everywhere. So I was, I was all over the pitch, man, covering every blade of grass. So, and then, you know, in PDL, I had a coach who I actually played for for my second pro team uh, in Charlotte. Mm. Uh, he, he pulled me aside with my first two sessions, like uh, when he brought me over to Mississippi Brea, which is where I played PDL for the first two years. He brought me over and he was like, man, I, I think, I think you're gonna. I think you could be a really good right back as a pro. And for me, it's like I, I, I'm like whatever. You know, I'm a I'm a 18, turning 19 year old kid. You know, uh, just want to play football, man. I just want to play football. And he brought me there to Mississippi, who at the time they were a very strong team, and you know, good in the PDL. And he brought in some very very good 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 uh, players that year. A mm. couple of which. Played in the MLS, right? A lot in the USL, some overseas. So he told me that, and I was like, and I looked at the guys who were, who were playing in the midfield at the time. I was like, all right, fair enough. I'm probably I'm probably not gonna beat that guy out right now, right? It's a lot, two and a half, three month season, but I get to play on the field as a right back. All right, I'm a right back. Right back it is then. Mm, so exactly. that's kind of how I got converted to a right back. Which I mean, growing up, I had always played, you know, like I said, all across the back, left back, center back. And right back, but at that time I hadn't played it in many years. So yeah, played as a right back and you know did very well that summer. And he brought me back the summer after as a right back. And then uh the next two teams I played for uh brought me in. So I played all my PDL seasons as a right back, wow. my entire college career as a as a midfielder. And so whenever it was time for me to go pro, the coach that saw me that invited me to the combine. He saw me play as a right back in PDL. So he was like, yeah, we want you to come in and try it as a right back. So that's kind of how I started my career as a right back and played probably 
let's say six seasons in the USL as, as a right back. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah, man, that's, you know, that's huge, man. It just shows the importance of versatility. And, and like you said, going back to what we said in the beginning, you just, you, you take whatever opportunity you can get and you get the most, you make the most of it, you know? Um, you know, I get tons of questions like, you know, I'm a number six, but my coach wants me to play as a, as a left back or a winger. And just like you said, I always say, you know, it's like, as long as you're on the pitch, you can show your ability, you know? Oh yeah. Um, and, and I think also the advantage of playing multiple positions is whether you're playing, you know, your favorite position as a six, or you're playing another position as a right back, you know, different scenarios and situations. So you play the guy to this foot, you play him in this space, because you've played there before and you know where you want it. So I think that's also a big advantage of the, you know, of, of playing in, in multiple positions. Yeah, for sure, man. I think if I were to, were to give an advice on that to any young player right now who are worried about, oh, man, I'm a 10, but my coach wants to play me as an 8 or he wants to play me as a 7 or 11, at the end of the day, you're a footballer. That's it. You're not a number. You're not a position. You're a footballer. And – in order to 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 play at the highest level, you need to understand every single position on the field. You may maybe you're not going to play all of them, but you need to understand them, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, you're connecting passes with those guys, right? And so, I would advise every single young player that you know are listening to this or is going to listen to this at some point, make sure that you're competent at at least at least two position, and I wouldn't say three, but at least two. For right. Sure. So if you're if you're a defender, ideally you want to be able to play all the, all across the back. Right. Yeah. If you're a midfielder, you should be able to play anywhere in midfield, right? As a as a mm. 10, as a six, as an eight. Mm. If you're a winger, you should try to be competent as playing as a nine as well. Right. Because when you go into high level teams and high level situations, and now mm. you've you've only been playing as a right winger your entire career, and you go into a team and they have a, somebody that's better than you at the moment that you're not going to beat out for a spot, okay, are you going to sit on the bench? Where else can you play? Can exactly. you play as a left winger? Better yet, can you play as a 10? Even better, can you help the team as a 9, right? And so, man, just you're a footballer. And football is football, right? It's just understanding how the different positions work and, and, and understanding how, they differ, how the different uh, players connect with one another. So young players don't get locked into to don't don't labor yourself as a position or as a number. You're yeah. a footballer, right? And you need to be competent at many different positions. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. And and you know, a couple of thoughts came to mind. I think, you know, we we now think that you should only do position specific training, and that has its uses. Everything, you know, I think nowadays everything's like two zero to one hundred. It's like there's a gray area, you know, like. Some people will say, yeah, you shouldn't do ball mastery. Uh, you know, it's about, just like you said, it's about getting comfortable in every little pocket of the game, those little yeah. details. So like you said in the very beginning, you just, you went out, you played football. You know, you're playing small sided, whether it be, you know, 4v4, 5v5. You're just on the, you know, you're on, you're getting on the ball, you're getting touches, you're in different situations, different uh, uh, pressure. So you, mm -hmm. you have to your way out of it and I think that's the use of small sided you know you get used to just being on the ball and, and, and being under pressure and not having a, a lot of time to make a decision so you got to start to make quicker decisions which helps right with big pitch and then obviously you know you do your your um basic training you know your 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 one touch passing your two touch passing your long balls your 1v1 defending and then you could do, go into that position specific stuff so I think it's that's what what makes football so beautiful for yeah. me yeah yeah it's all those aspects. It's not just, just do this and you're going to get here because you, mm -hmm. know, you always get those questions of what do I need to do? It's that's what makes it so beautiful and so difficult. There's so many different avenues that you have to, you know, explore. And I think the whole thing is it's this whole journey. It's a self discovery at the end of the day, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the way I look at it um, is if, if I'm a, a, a center back, right, I want to understand the role of the next center back, the center back that's next to me, understand the role of the fullback that's next to me, understand the role of the midfielder that's in front of me, or if they, you know, there's two midfielders or whatever, 
Because at the end of the day, you're always playing to those guys. You're always playing with those guys, right? So it's about understanding the roles around you and be able to uh, as well, you know, because the game is as such. You know, the game is always changing, right? P players out of position. Can you slide in and do his job for him, right? Yes. Make him look like a better player, which in turn makes you a better player, right? Are you comfortable sliding out as a fullback when the fullback is caught high in transition moments, right? To delay, break up the, the play or whatever, right? Put the fire out and start a counterattack. Are you comfortable doing that? Or are you just a center back that's just going to stand in the middle of the field? Stand in the eighteen yard box, right? So it th that's how I look at it. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that, man. Yeah, uh, appreciate th those words. If, if we could go, you know, into your uh, pro journey, you know, uh, how it went at Tampa Bay, um, and then yeah, a little, you know, a little bit through the years. Yeah, so I'll elaborate a little bit on that. So my first year as a pro. Uh, it was a good year, you know, went down there to VSI, it was an expansion team, so the whole team was new, um, mm -hmm. new coach, new players, right, new organization, went down, did very well in preseason, I made sure I went in fit and sharp, and, you know, I was doing well in preseason scrimmages and so on and so forth, and, and this is where the reality of being a pro hit, um, you know, when at the time, a lot of the veteran guys that the club had signed, they weren't in preseason with us, right? So they came later with like two months left into pre in preseason going into the season. As soon as they came, it was like a whole different dynamic, right? Those guys were thrown in. The younger guys were kind of moved back. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost like, man, what have I done? You know, um, but I was playing well. I was playing every minute. And now I'm not even getting on the field. Exactly. And that's something that I feel like young players need to be prepared for, right? Football, like not everything is this linear path where you do this and you get that. You do this, this happens. So there's a lot of ups and downs, man. And, you know, when you have business, politics and all these things tied into it, you have to be prepared for that. Um, and so that's something that I wasn't necessarily prepared for, but I'm glad I kind of experienced it so early in my career because it kind of helped me to develop that mindset, right, of, Okay, well, it's not now, but keep working. But anyways, those guys came in, you know, just kind of stopped playing, but still training, still, you know, getting better in training because I'm playing high-level football with quality players, high-level players in a high-performance environment. And so first season came around, first seven games of the season, didn't see my jersey, right? Mm -hmm. And at this point, I, I'm thinking I'm a starter, you know, and, and you know, young player come in and the chest is big, you know, and I'm puffing my chest and, all my friends are texting me, hitting me up on social media. Man, I can't wait to see you play. I'm so proud of you, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, first seven games, didn't see my jersey. Didn't even know what my last name looked like on the back, right? Mm. Um, but just so happened I was, again, on top of my training, you know, still with a good a good mentality, good attitude. And uh, seven game, eight games in, the coach left the team. A new coach took over. And just like that, I was thrown in my first season as a pro, as a left back, wow. right? And ended up finishing the season, played every single minute as a left back that year. Um, I think I played 18 games, right? Wow. And it was, it was a good experience, man. Good experience. Um, obviously, not the position that I was comfortable with, but it was, again, I want to be on the field. I just want to play football, man. So uh, made it work, you know. Again, went back, watched film. And trying to see how I could make if I was very uncomfortable opening up on my left foot to roll that ball down, you know, to my left winger. So I ended up cutting back a lot of times to play into midfield or play back. So watch film and uh improved a little bit, you know, from 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 where I thought at the time my my flaws were. And finish the season out there, team folds. Right. And again, another lesson uh, uh, for young players, you know, it's not all sunshine and rainbows at, at the professional level, man. Like I, I, there's a lot of stuff that goes down that I feel like pros don't tell the true backstory, you know? And, and, and that's why I respect you so much, you know, and you and your platform to hey, just keep it real, man. And this is how it is at the professional level. And this is what you need to do to give yourself a chance, not a guarantee. Mm -hmm. Right. So anyways, the team folded. And so, at that time, the league was only five months, so I'm back home now and just played five months and now have like a six-month offseason. So it's like, man, what am I going to do in, in six months? You know, I'm going to lose everything that I've gained over the season. And just so so happened that um, 
Charlotte Eagles at the time, they were in when they were in the USL, they had been watching my games a little bit, and I, I happened to play for the the head the assistant coach in PDL, mm-hmm. who told me I was gonna be a really good right back at the pro level. So he had just taken a job with the Eagles and um as an assistant suggested the suggested me to the head coach. Um they took a gamble. They just signed me, um, you know, without without bringing me in. They saw me p- from playing against them a little bit, took a gamble, signed me. And, yeah, went up there. And it was a good good environment for me to be in at that time. You know, it was uh, Charlotte Eagles, for those who don't know, it's it's a ministry. Um, you know, Missionary Athletes International runs it. And it was a really good environment, man, just a brotherhood. And so I was able to just focus on football, you know, and and, and just get, get things together off the field. You know, I wasn't in the true – professional environment as most would think you know big cities you know you go out three points and you're on downtown at the bars at night so I was in a really good environment yeah um, played about 18 games that season and then from there at the time St. Louis FC they were starting another expansion team and they were, they were scouting the league and really liked what I was doing you know at the time I was trying to be an attacking fullback you know just trying to get involved in the attack, you know, create some assists, um, get involved and and just just enjoy the game, man, from both sides of it. Exactly. So yeah, they were they were scouting. GM gave gave me a call um in the off season, said he liked, you know, like what I have to offer and they would like to offer me a contract. And so at the time I'm three years in, right? I'm getting offered a two year guaranteed contract. I'm not gonna turn it down. You know, I'm like, all right, let's do it. You know, um I don't need to explore anything else. And um we did that, wrapped up the deal. I was in St. Louis for two seasons. Had a had a two good years. Mm. First year started off rough. Um, you know, when I first went there, playing probably the best football of my professional career so far. How um, old were you just when you first went over? I was twenty five at the time. Were you playing under? T- Say again. Were you playing under Preki over there? No, I was playing under Dale Shilly. So it was 2015 and, and 16. So when I went in 2016, I, you know, playing some really good football, man. You know, things are happening. My game is starting to kind of mature and come together. And I get called up to the national team for Copa America, for Jamaica, you know, and uh, nice. Copa America and Chile. This was due to, uh, whenever we had uh, Argentina, Uruguay in our group. So get called up to the national team, and uh, at this time I'm at the high, right? And and uh, there's so many lessons in here, man. I'm at the high, high of my career. Um, so I'm feeling good, you know. Again, you know, puffing my chest, you know, feeling confident, and you know, that swagger started to come. And we're playing Minnesota and Open Cup. Um, uh, it was in like April, April or June. We're playing Minnesota, Minnesota, and Open Cup a week before I'm supposed to leave to go meet the team in Chile. Mm. And in this, in this summer, I got called up for Copa America and Gold Cup in the same summer. Wow! A week before I'm supposed to leave to go meet the team in Chile, uh, go in a tackle, bomb, tore my eight, my MCL, Jeez. and just like that, the, just like that, the entire everything just got swept away. I was three and a half months off the pitch. So I missed Copa America, missed the Gold Cup, came back in uh, that season and played two games. So I ended up playing a total of like 10 games that season. But mm. which was, you know, obviously you look at that and it's like, man, that's, that, that, that's sad, which it was. But I would say that was kind of, for me, a really good point in my career where I learned so much, you know, in that three and a half months that I was off. You know, you spend a couple of weeks feeling sorry for yourself and you're down, you know, why me, this and that. You know, I was supposed to get a good opportunity, go show, maybe get, you know, these are the things I'm thinking, you know, uh, maybe do well and, and I'm, I go to Europe and blah, blah, blah. But that, it, it wasn't meant to be, man. It didn't happen. And so, you know, just started to get, get after my rehab after about two, three weeks. I was supposed to be done for the season. And I was lucky enough to come back and finish two games and took everything that I learned from from the uh from my rehab and that time that I was out to apply to my off season, right? And then came back the next season. I probably had the best season I've had as a pro so far. You wow. know, and a lot of that is is just kind of like the way I started to apply what I already knew but wasn't really doing, like all the details. So I studied exercise science in college. Wow. And so 
always was interested in the body and how it worked and everything, but never really applied those things, right? But it wasn't until I did get injured and I started to work with like a sports performance coach and he really started to show me some things, you know, and I was like, man, wow, that's, that's interesting, fascinating. Mm. So just soaked up as much knowledge as I could from him and um, applied those in my off season and uh, came back like, uh, you know, probably a twice as best, a better player um, the next season. And uh, from there, my time ended at, at, uh, at uh, St. Louis. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, but I'd like to, I want to dive in a little bit to that situation. Mm -hmm. Um, Because like you said, man, like, man, you're on top. You had, you know, a couple, you know, highs and lows in the beginning of your career. Like you said, you're at an all time high and you know, this, this MCL injury happens. What are your, like, you know, how are you dealing with it right away mentally? You know, the first, you know, first couple days, couple weeks, and then what is the switch? What is the change, the, the, the change in perspective? You know, I like to say the flip of the switch that mm-hmm. makes you completely dial in and you say to yourself, all right, you know, this is the, this is the reality and this is what I'm going to do to get there. What is that shift? How, how does that manifest? Yeah. So for me, it was probably like a couple weeks in, like two, three weeks in. Like I said, the first two weeks was tough for me, man. I was locked in my room, you know, because I didn't have to do surgery. So I, I only did my MCL. I didn't do any other ligament damage. And the MCL is the only ligament in the knee that has enough blood flow to heal by itself, right? So, okay. like, brace you up, crutch you up, and you just shut it down. Still had to show up to training, right? But, yeah, I just, I was, just, dude, just locked in my room for, like, two days. Um, I mean, two weeks. Mm. Like, feeling sorry for myself, you know? Um, why me? You know, I was supposed to be there. I'm, you know, watching the games on, on online. I'm like, man, that was supposed to be me, blah, blah, blah. Even though the guy that played, in my position was Adrian Mariapa, who was playing for Crystal Palace at the time, right? <laughs> oh, that was supposed to be me. I was supposed to be there. I was supposed to be Mark and Messi, you know? It's like... <laughs> yeah. But the, what hit for me was when I started my rehab, right? And the thing with injuries is, man, we can, in, like, not even just football, like in sports, in life, in general, you can't predict when bad things are going to happen. You can't predict when injuries are going to happen, right? And so that was a quote from my therapy. It was like, yeah, he saw that it was really affecting me right um my therapist and so it was that first week of of therapy for me when you know started to talk to him a little bit is that man i get a lot of athletes in here and they all bounce back right Uh, most of them bounce back you know the ones that don't bounce back they eventually do but a lot of times it's too late right it's they they rob themselves of all the time that they could use to make progress and i was like oh man like I'm trying to get back on the field, right? I'm trying to play football. But yeah. those first two weeks, I'm like, man, I've never had a knee injury before. Am I going to be able to play again? Blah, blah, blah. And so he just re- gave me the reassurance of, yeah, you're going to be fine if you take your rehab seriously, right? And if you do the extras and if you're on top of things. And mm-hmm. so that was kind of where it kind of started for me. And where when it really flicked was like the first couple of weeks doing therapy and seeing the little progress that I was making. Exactly. And for me, I'm a big believer in, you know, making little steps, right? Brick by brick. And then in, in the long run, you make a lot of progress. And so, so it was like two weeks into therapy when I was seeing the little progress, like, man, I'm, I'm getting more stability in the knee now, right? Um, I, I'm able to, to not run, but I'm able to, to, to speed walk, you know? And then a week later, I'm able to jog a little bit. And then, you know, I'm able to to pass a ball a little. And for me, that was when it kind of flicked. Like, okay, man, like, this is all actually all up to me. This is all up to me. So, if yeah, I need to put the work in. I need to do the extra. So, that's when I started asking questions. What can I do um, better? Can I, what can help to speed me up? Do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? And just, you know, like I said, soaking up as much knowledge as I could. And that was the light switch moment when I was like, I mean, I have a choice to make. It's either I can keep feeling sorry for myself and stay in that dark place that I was the first two weeks and not make progress, or I can keep doing this. And even though it's not, I'm not going to be back on the field tomorrow, but I'm making a little progress. I'm able to do a little bit more each day. Mm-hmm. So let's just continue. And maybe I'll be able to to get back on the field this season. And that's that's what I did. And that's what happened. 100%. Yeah, man, you, you nailed it right on, on the head, man. I think 
you know, obviously we always, we hear the quote of like, enjoy the process and, and, and mm -hmm. take small steps and Rome wasn't built in a day. But right. until, like you said, until you get put in that situation of discomfort of, you know, missing the, the game that you love, that you do every single day, you don't realize it's like, then you really become grateful for all, like you said, those tiny milestones, you know, being able to walk, yeah. speed walk, jog, sprint, you know, and, and then I think that really teaches you, you know, during and after the injury to first of all, be grateful that, you know, you get to do it every single day. Yeah. You, know, you never know when it's going to be taken away from you. And then the second thing is to enjoy those little milestones, whether it's, you know, in season, off season, and really trying to enjoy the present moment in every, every step of the way, you know? Yeah. Do, do simple things consistently. Well, that's, that's a motto that I live by and it's within the, within football, within training, within rehab. And if you have that mindset, right, where you don't expect any big gains too quickly, right? You just expect that, okay, I'm going to do this and I might not get the result right away. It might be a week down the road, right? Yeah. Or it might be a couple of weeks down the road. But if I know if I keep doing it and I keep doing it, I'm going to get better. I'm going to get fitter. I'm going to get sharper. I'm going to get stronger, whatever it is. Exactly. But it's not the immediate result because I feel like that's kind of life today, right? We live in a, this, this uh, instant gratification world where, oh, man, I do this. I should get that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like just do, do the simple things. Do them well. And in time, it's going to add up. And it's going to add that compound effect. Maybe six months down the road, it's going to be massive, right? Because now you're building a really strong foundation that nobody can break, right? No, because you've been doing the work and you've been building from the bottom. When you when you get there, it's like somebody may be able to knock it on a notch, but you're still up there, right? Exactly. And so that, that applies to whether you're doing strength work in the gym, right? Whether you're doing fitness on the field, uh, whether you're doing uh, your technical work, you know, it applies to everything, man. Just continue to stack the simple things on one another. And eventually, when you start doing the, the complicated thing, you won't be able to mess up, right? You won't be able to be stopped because those are all built from a really good foundation. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. I always say do the simple things and then those more complex things will be so much easier. You know, it's and then, like you said, it's 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 about building that positive momentum, you know, once you really get into that zone, you know, it's just, you just keep on moving. You keep on moving yeah. forward. Yeah, so, man. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, a lot of, uh, I, I'll, and I'll say this too, you know, football and sports, I feel like in general is a culture of where, you know, you see the players at certain level, whether it's you're on the top half of the team or the top half of the league, blah, blah, blah. And it's a culture where players puff their chest, right? Like I said, I got called up national team and I'm puffing my chest, you know, and I got humbled. Yeah. I got humbled by the game, man. You know, it's like, well, that's not how you're supposed to act. Well, I'm injury and I'm out. I lost it all. And, you know, it's a culture where everybody's flexing and everybody's, you know, puffing the chest and everybody's doing that. But I would say just for young players, just to be humble with your success, be humble with your progress and always knowing that you have so much more to go, man, because there's always going to be a player out there that's better than you, right? There's always going to be, think about how many footballers are in this world, man. There's always going to be a player out there that's better than you, that's fitter than you, that, that's more skillful than you, right? That knows the game, can read the game better than you. So it's about making progress, but being humble about it, right? Being humble about it and just always going, oh, okay, I need to, I need, I need to learn more, right? I need to be better 1% each day. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's just a mindset uh, tip for me for, for, for young players because I learned I learned it early, you know, yeah. luckily. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, just like you said, it's, football is a revolving door. Um, and, and I think, you know, you pointed it out multiple times in, in this, you know, conversation. It's about being a student of the game. A uh, student of mm -hmm. life, always willing to learn more, search for new information for yourself to, to improve, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's, so how, so after the MCL injury coming back, uh, what was the rest of the rest of the way? Yeah. So uh, next season came back and, you know, like I said, applied everything that I learned from my rehab and from that time that I was out, 
um, and started to d dive a little bit more deeper now in uh, my 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 field, so to speak. You know, I studied exercise science, so I started to dive deeper into, man, like how can I how because after seeing the progress that I made from being injured and coming back, and like, I was like, wow, yeah. like if I can continue to like get better in this field and keep adding on this, like, man, the sky's the limit. So, you know, started to dive deeper in that and started to apply what I was learning to my game. And so came back in the second season with St. Louis and, you know, had a, had a great season, man. Um, and individually, I would say. And then from there, uh, OKC Energy FC, who was my second team at the time, um, the coach, we played them four times. And uh, every time that I played them, I I, I, I was like a, a winger and a fullback at the same time. Yeah. And so every, after every game, the coach would come up to me, you know, Jimmy Nielsen, who won, won, won MLS Cup, he's Danish, Danish legend. You know, um, he came up to me, he's like, man, uh, like, to be honest, we played you four times and I didn't know what to do with you. Like the the all the scout was about how we can stop the fullback. And I was like, so, yeah. all right. So it's like after the last game, you know, he asked me, Hey, what what's going on? You know, you like it here? And 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 you know, I didn't put it together at that time, but um, you know, come because obviously contract, you know, you gotta be careful of how you scout players and stuff. So, anyways, he liked me enough to in the off season. You know, I was leaving St. Louis, and right away, uh, my agent he connected uh, with my agent and offered me offered me a contract there, and uh, went over to OKC. had had a a really good first year. You know, we went to the to the conference final, uh, Western Conference final of of the league. Um, a really good group of guys. You know, some top players. Um, and so had a, had a really, really good year there, man. Um, I would say to that point, you know, I was having like the best year of my career again. Yeah. Um, and then Jimmy Nielsen left the club with the staff, new coach came in. So I, 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 I had, uh, renewed my contract there, played a second year there, did well, but the team didn't do well. And I just kind of wanted something new. You know, I had been in the Midwest for at that time, four years. Mm -hmm. And um, was just looking for something new. I wanted to move back East Coast, uh, close to friends and family, and uh, just somewhere where I could, you know, settle down and 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 start to kind of build roots with the game, you know, and in the community and stuff like that. And sure. uh, Chattanooga Red Wolves at the time, you know, they were starting something new in League One, USL League One. The league was about to be launched and uh, new club, new everything. And that's uh, obviously you came to Chattanooga and you probably know a little bit. It's kind of a sore topic. So, sure. um, but anyways, went there and um, dealt with another setback, right? I had mm -hmm. surgery on my foot. I was out for most of the season, uh, played only six games there and uh, ended up leaving, coming over to Chattanooga Football Club, which is where I've been mm -hmm. playing in NISA for, uh, this is my third season with Chattanooga Football Club. So, nice. yeah, that's that's the the... The long journey, man. Uh, ten year journey, for sure. Yeah. No, I love it, man. And and you guys, like we spoke about before we went live, you guys are really doing well this season. I know you, you went pretty far in the Open Cup. You ended up uh, playing Atlanta United. Mm -hmm. how, how was that experience? Oh, that was. Uh, it was good. It was a really good experience, man. Obviously, the result didn't even get close to go going our way, but yeah, it was yeah. a top experience for 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 the club and for a lot of the young guys on 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 the team that are trying to, you know, make a move to that next level. And what better way, man, but to play against one of the top teams in North America, you know, and um, had a really good, good, good game against Memphis, beat them 3-1, I think, at home. Then went to play Atlanta United, and they, they're they a top team, right? they $81 million payroll, um, and it – it was a really good display and it was good for our group and, and our guys to see that, Hey, if you want to be the best, you know, that's, that's, that's it right there. That's the level, right? It's doing the simple things consistently. Well, those guys didn't do anything special, right? They just, they knew where each other were going to be, right? They completed their passes, right? They played the right, the right passes at the right time with the right weight. Mm -hmm. And they were clinical in front of goal and we got, we lost six nil, you know? Mm -hmm. So, it, it's it was it was another level it was another level and it was really good to see um you know for, for a lot of our guys i mean obviously playing for a long time in the usl i played against quite a few mls teams mm. in open cup and everything like that you know played against uh 
like Pachuca, for instance, in a friendly when I was okay at OKC. And it's like that type of level, man. It's like guys are popping the ball around and sometimes you're trying to keep up with it, you know, on the field. So it's it's sometimes when you think that you're at a good level and you're playing well and you're flying and then you go play a team, it's it just humbles you, you know. So it was a humbling moment for for our guys, you know, to say that's the level and I need to put in a lot of work to get there. So, but yeah, it was good. Sure. Amen, bro. Amen. Yeah, if you could just, you know, take us, you know, obviously you've, you've been a pro for 10 years. If you could take us real quick, just through, you know, a day in your life in season at Chattanooga, you know, just for the younger guys and girls watching, you know, really, you know, learn how to take care of themselves. And obviously you are where you are because of the routine you have um, yep. and, and how you take care of yourself. So, yeah, you know, what time you wake up and how your morning looks, you know, what you eat for breakfast before training, you know, and, and things like this. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to give two different scenarios. So I'm like coaching a lot now, right? And that's just recently I've cuz I'm you know, want to get involved in coaching, so I've been coaching quite a bit here lately. But before I I started coaching, my routine was so training at 9 a.m., right? So anywhere, getting up anywhere from like 6.45, 7, you know, you have your you have your breakfast and do your little pre – I do my little pre-workout at home, you know, maybe like just a, uh, uh, not a full yoga session, five, ten minutes just to get my body loose, you know, to get up for the day. Um, don't have a heavy breakfast. I normally go with just, you know, some fruits or sometimes like – Depends on what, what we have here. We go with like a bagel, you know, cream cheese and stuff like that. Then have a little coffee. I've been a big fan of coffee lately. So I have like a, a cup of coffee, show up to the stadium where we're there at 8.15 every morning. So at the stadium and then I get into my actual uh, pre-training routine. And it's, it's mm. so I go a little bit of activation, right, with, with just body weight stuff. It's my you know, your squats, your side lunges, your just open up the hips, exactly. open up the hips and ankles, some ankle mobility, glute bridges, you know, turning the, the, the glutes on. Um, and then I go into my mini band activation. Um, and that has anything to do with for, from squats. Um, you have your lateral uh, marches, right? Your forward, backward marches, so on and so forth, your leg raises. Um, and I'm sure you, I mean, you have a plethora of all these on your, on your uh, platform. Yeah. So from there, you know, head out to training and get the training. So train starts at nine, get off the field anywhere from depending on the day, 10 30, sometimes 11 from training straight home, uh, have lunch. And then from lunch, hang out for about an hour, uh, hour and a half, then straight into the gym for a second session and depending on the day, that could look like a mobility session um, or it could look like, a, uh, you know, a strength session, which is just maintenance. You know, so if it's like on a Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday, for me, it's like I do a little bit more. Um, and if it's like a Thursday, Thursday or Friday, a little bit less. Right. So a little bit of flexibility, some core, uh, some mobility um, mm -hmm. closer to the game because we normally play on Saturdays. For so sure. from there, I'm back home you know, kick the feet up again, back home about like three o'clock, right? Mm. Three o'clock, 3.30, kick the feet up again. Um, you know, just kind of coming down from the day from two sessions. And then from there in the late afternoons, and I'm only trying to do something just like, that's just going to bring me down, right? And and so I can get ready for bed. So I normally either I foam roll and stretch, right? Or I will go to do like a, a float, like the, the sensor deprivation tank, right? Where you just lay in like a big Epsom salt, pretty much Epsom yeah. salt bath, right? And I'm a big fan of Epsom salt bath. And you just lay in there and you just chill out for 90 minutes and it just kind of brings awesome. the mind down. So for me, I use that as a time to kind of reflect a little bit, right? And I think about my last game, I, you know, after I finished playing, I watch film and I use that time to kind of just put the pieces together and dissect the game. And then from there, you know, come back home and, uh, have it have some dinner and um, I'm with the family man I have a wife and a baby so awesome. we if my my wife is is gone to bed earlier the baby's is gone to bed I normally watch film again right maybe I watch an old game or watch a little film of the opponent that we're about to play on the weekend 
Mm. Um, and if not, then if they're up, then we'll just watch a movie and then uh, we'll go to bed. Uh, so that's like if I'm not coaching, uh, when I wasn't coaching. So now since I'm coaching, that time that I used to go to the separate central deprivation tank, it now turns into coaching time, right? So um, second session, then I'm back home, you know, and I kick my feet up and then I'm back out to coach. And yeah. then I'm I'm home a little bit later in the in the night, probably like eight thirty, and um, you know with the family dinner when they go to bed, you know I quickly foam roll, I quickly stretch, mm-hmm. um, I sneak in some film. I always try to sneak in a little bit of film before before bed, and then I try to get it into bed. Uh, sometimes if I'm really good, ten thirty. Um, if it's a late night, anywhere from like eleven eleven thirty, I'm in bed, and so. Um, and that's cause I have so much going on right Well, now when I was younger, I was getting like 12 hours of sleep, man. And I was flying, feeling great. So that I suggest the young players, man, you know, get, get your, at least eight hours, get your eight hours. And, um, you know, that's, that's sufficient enough for, cause the body only recovers while you're sleeping. Right. Cause that's the only time you produce the, the hormone that, you know, heals your muscles. That's the only time your hair grows, your nails. And that's the only time the, the H, the human growth hormone, that's the only time when you're sleeping that you produce it. So get your sleep, um, you know, play young players, get your sleep and don't be up at 3 a.m. playing Xbox. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, dude, uh, you know, all the players listening, you could just hear the dedication in that. I mean, the guy just, you know, is completely dialed in and then, you know, massive respect for you. And you, you are where you are because of the dedication. You know, it's, it's just that simple. There's no secret. There's no trick, you know. So, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's class. W- what are you usually having for for for, um, for lunch and dinner? So lunch, I'm big on lunch. I'm big on dinner. Like I said, breakfast for me. Most yeah. days it's fruits. Yep. Yeah, um, sometimes it's always light. For me, I'm big on lunch. So I'll come home and. Um, if so, I try, I do at least three second sessions a week. Mm. Um, so if on the days that I'm not doing a second session, I'll have a little heavier lunch on the day mm. that I'm, I am doing a second session. I have a little lighter, but it's always a, uh, some kind of, uh, starch, whether it's potatoes or rice, uh, we're big on rice here at my house. So potatoes or rice or sweet potatoes. Um, I'm not a big fan of pasta. Um, that's just because I didn't grow up eating it. I'm a big fan of like grains and, you know, things from the from the ground. And so that's always my starch. And then uh, I, we only eat fish and chicken. Yes, fish, chicken. Sometimes we eat some beef. Plus. Um, so my wife makes, you know, different type of chicken and, uh, you know, brown, she curry it sometimes, brown stew. She sometimes mm-hmm. um, barbecue it. Um, and then... Uh, steam veggies so we're really big on steam veggies so if i'm not having like a, a full salad like a raw salad it's always steam veggies and that goes anywhere from like corn green beans um carrots um mm-hmm. just the whole host there off of uh, uh steam veggies so most of the times i eat what i had for lunch i have the same thing for dinner Mm-hmm. Um, just because we just do it in bulk, so it's you know yeah. convenient. And but yeah, that's that's most mostly it. You got your uh, chicken or fish, sometimes beef for dinner. Yeah, mm-hmm. so because sometimes you know you get tired of eating the same thing. So sometimes I have like a little bit of steak, you know, for dinner every sure. now and then. Um, and then sometimes we just go vegan, man. You know, sometimes it 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 it's it's just we feel like we've been having. Uh, for me, I feel like if I have too much meat, you know, like continuously over and over i'll just go like uh, a week or two weeks off just eating no meat you mm. know and it kind of clears my system out and that's it's just for me it's just how i how i feel i was mm. for probably like a year and a half when i was in st louis i went with a pescatarian diet nice. right so i just had fish i just ate fish and veggies and you know obviously starches but that's the only meat so uh, that i ate and that was the best i felt my whole career right so every now and then we'll just you know Maybe like a week or two weeks, we'll go vegan. And uh, then from there, we start adding things back in. For sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just all about listening to the body, seeing what works for you. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, but it sounds really, really good. I know you got to get going soon. I'll just end off with some some last questions here. Yeah, Um, no, no. We take your time. Take your time. Let's not rush it. Okay, brother. Okay. 
yeah, I mean, we, we talked about, you know, some, some quality things and, you know, I, th I think it's all about, you know, given, given the, the guys and girls listen that, that practical um, knowledge to, to input into their life. And I think, you know, I think it's worth it to rewatch this, take some notes. I mean, I think, you know, it's been really, really class. Um, one thing I do want to ask is you talked about sensory deprivation and stuff like this. And I think as footballers, especially, you know, pro footballers and, and, and footballers who are looking to continuously push to, to the next level, we're always thinking about football, you know, and just like you said, with, with sleep, um, you know, from a recovery standpoint, I think it's also very uh, beneficial sometimes to unwind from football, whether it's a yeah. day, whether it's half a day. So, you know, obviously you said you have a family, which is excellent. How, how do you unwind from football? So, and that's, that's actually a really good question, you know, cause that's, that's, that's my life, you know, it's been my life for a very long time. And so, you know, when I, I, I didn't have a family, you know, it was, finish training and as a footballer you have so much free time man you 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 play you we done with we're done with training at at 11 a.m most days and you know you come home at lunchtime and a lot of time it's just chilling there you know and, and, and whether it was watching a tv show or you know going to have a have, have a uh, have a coffee with friends you know or go, going to play some you know bowling or whatever that's kind of how i did it um and I'm I'm a really big big fan of you know, doing because like I said football in my life and for every anybody that that loves the game right it's it's it consumes you but if you don't disconnect it's very hard to kind of see where you're you, what direction you're heading in right so every now and then man I like to just like step away step out of it and say okay well this is where I'm at right this is where I want to go. Am I going in the right direction, right? And the way that I do that is sometimes, man, it's just just going to hang out with friends outside of football, right? Somebody that doesn't even understand the game. Somebody that, that doesn't. It's really good sometimes to hear from somebody who doesn't understand football. And I've never played football before. You know, sure. you know, just ask them any random question. Hey, you came to the game the other day. What did you think? Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's a conversation that it can kind of test you as well, right? to explain to some somebody something that they don't understand, you know? And, and so it tests your knowledge where, well, in this situation, the reason why this happened, blah, blah, blah. And so disconnect from it to then come back to it, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, now with my two-year-old daughter um, and my wife and coaching a lot, man, it's all football. And how I disconnect is the 90 minutes I get in the essential deprivation tank, which I, I'm actually about to go when we get off here. Okay. Yeah, that's the 90 minutes that I get to just, you know, completely shut down, completely shut off and, you know, just just kind of look at life from the outside, you know, and just just, mm -hmm. just look at look at everything from a holistic point of view. Oh, um, nice. How do I do I switch off from football? It's 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 a tough one. It's a tough one to be honest. I I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. No, and I, I think I think what you say is 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 so valuable. I think and that's why I think those sensory deprivation tanks are are, are so uh, valuable. It's because you know, we're we're constantly being um everything's trying to take our attention, you know. There's so much stimuli from all over whether it's TikTok, Instagram, all this crap, there's notifications. So yep. it's like, how can you disconnect, like you said, and look at everything from a macro standpoint? So whether it's, you know, like you say, going in that sensory deprivation tank. For me, I love like just going on like nature walks without my phone. Just mm -hmm. think, you know. Um, and yeah, I think it's so valuable. And, and the reason I, I love this question is because, you know, I think a lot of players think that it needs to be 24-7. Which, like, for, you know, you have to be looking after yourself. It is a full-time, more than a full-time job. It's a full-time gig. It's your life. Right. So there needs to be a time where you unplug a little, you know, because like you said, like, you know, th this one neuroscientist that I love, Andrew Huberman, he talks about, like, high performers. We have, we have a, you know, an on and off switch. You got to be able to turn it on. You got to be, be able to turn it off. You can't always be on because then when you, when you step onto the pitch – 
you might not be able to bring your full quality concentration and, and attention, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely, man. That's absolutely correct. Um, I, I would say, you know, going back to that question for me right now, the way that I disconnect is like when I'm with my family. Right. So when I'm around uh, and my daughter's two, two and a, she's two years, six months. Right. She doesn't really, she understand that that data goes and kick the ball every Saturday, you know, and uh, she's there and she comes down on the field with me. But whenever we're home, like whenever I come home, you know, and we're unwinding, we're watching a Netflix, you know, whether a movie or a show or whatever, that's the moment, man. For me, it is almost, there's never any football there, right? It's just about enjoying time with my family, you know, afternoons when I come home and I don't have a coaching session, I'm taking my, 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 my daughter out for a walk, you know, we're going, walking down by the river, or we're going to the creek, you know, to go swim in the creek or where sometimes we go up to the mountain to watch the sunset. Nice. And I'm a really big family guy, man. You know, family, family is everything for me. So, you know, it's constantly on the phone with my folks back home in Jamaica, in Florida, you know, and with my family here. It's just just enjoying life, man. You know, life has so much to offer. And it's, it's, it's just realizing that even for me here, football, like I'm going to be a player for a small fraction of my life. I'm going to live longer than I'll ever play football, right? So it's about how can I connect you know with different people and different things and different activities outside of football because at the end of the day that's going to be most of my life right and for me most of it is just through my family you know enjoying life with my family when the when there's no saturday night lights when there's no ball when my teammates are not around my coach right it's, it's like okay it's just you and your life just enjoy it right mm -hmm. so all right let's go out for a dinner let's go bowling let's go watch a sunset so on and so forth yeah no, I love that, man. I love that. It's class. And, and you know, I think that's, that's what, what children really teach you, man. Like just enjoying the little things, you know, every, every step, you know, not overcomplicating things and just being in that present moment, you know. I mean, you, Absolutely. you know more than I know, but that's just what I observe. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a life changer, man. It's a life changer, you know, just even the, the simple thing, you know, of teaching somebody how to kick a ball, like, you know, when you're a footballer and you're, oh, man, I can do this, I can do that, blah, blah, blah. Now I got to teach my little two-year-old, okay, no, this is how you kick it. You know, you don't pick it up. It teaches you, like, man, those things are, are so important because everybody's learning, right? At the end of the day, no matter where you are, even for me, I'm still learning. Now my, my two-year-old is learning the basic. For me, I'm learning now how to be a better teammate, right, a better leader, a better captain. You know, mm -hmm. those are the things that I'm always thinking about, man. It's, it's man, how can I better serve my, my team? You know, how can I um, better serve the guys to make them feel like they belong, right? And, and that, like, they're valuable, you know, they're valuable people. And not just what they can do as a footballer, but as, as a human being, you know, how can I, can I let them feel that, hey, man, I really appreciate you, you know, and how can I, it's, and that, that's because that's life, right? And these guys, like most most players, when you play at a professional level, you meet guys and you're with them for a year or two years or you know, and then they're gone, mm. right? But it's the relationships that's that 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 always stays, man. So it's just connecting with people, man. Connecting with people and realize that at the end of the day, we're all we all just trying to figure it out, man. As a footballer, you're trying to be better. You're trying to go to the next level. You know, you're trying to to just continue to enjoy the game and and try to achieve something that is valuable to you, you know, and, and as, as a, just a human being, you're just trying to connect with people, you know? Mm. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, just tying it all together, man. And when I'm with football, I'm trying to make people better and pay, pay people feel valuable. When I'm not with football, it's the same thing. Yeah. No, that's class, man. And it, you know, I think the whole, you know, I was going to ask you a question on how, you know, how to be a good captain, a good leader, which we could get into a little bit, but I think, if you really, like we talked about, take a look at this podcast from a macro standpoint, this conversation, you can hear that you're a natural, you're, you're a leader, you know, you want to impact people, you want to, you know, make them feel comfortable, make them feel at home. That, that's the goal, you know, and, and leave, leave a, a good impact on no matter who it is. Um, so, yeah, man, no, I, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm sure that's why the club's doing so well. It's those little those little things that really add up, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, like I said, Eric, at the end of the day, man, 
at this level, at a professional level, we're all just trying to eat, right? We're trying to we're trying to be better footballers. We're trying to go to the next level, and we just we're trying to enjoy the game, you know. And so, for me, uh, what makes a a, a a a good leader, right, and a good captain is just somebody that can get the best out of the right, the other guys around them, right? And for me, it's going every day in training, on the field, right, and off the field, just setting a good example, right? So you go in every day, right, and you set a high standard. You make a high standard. Guys, right, we're going to be on time. We're always going to work hard, right? We're always going to work for the next the man next to us. We're going to push each other, but we're going to be respectful, you know? And when, when things are not going well, we're going to come together. We're going to talk about it. We're going to try to figure it out as a group. You know, if one man is down, that's a chink in the chain that we got to fix, right? Because then it, 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 at some point that rotation is going to happen and it's going to fall apart, exactly. right? So it's just making sure that everybody is taken care of, right? Whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, on the field, off the field, all around, right? It's just looking out for the human being, you know? Take the, take the soccer player away, look out for the human being first. And then once the, once the person is good, man, that person will run through a brick wall, you know, for anybody. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's that's how I, I I look at it, man. It's just leading by example. But in order for your teammates to do that for you, you have to be able to do it for each and every one of them, for all twenty five guys, right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that that's class, man. And then um, you know, this one psychologist I like, Jordan Peterson, always talks about you know it's about changing one life at a time because that mm-hmm. that one person has a node of a network. You know, maybe they have. 50 people that they talk to regularly, but then those people know others. And it's like, how can you change that one person to change thousands? You know what I mean? It's like Absolutely. leaving that mark. No, no yeah. I appreciate that, man. I really do. And um, last couple questions for you. Uh, a little quick fire round. You have one, one book recommendation for, for the footballers listening. Ooh, ego is my enemy. Ryan so, Holiday. Yeah, that's let me let me yeah. Ryan Holiday. That's it. Yeah, that's that's a good book. I tell you, that's a really good book. I got given by a friend, read it a couple of years ago. I was like, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's what I needed, and I feel like that will add value to anybody's mindset. For sure, for sure, bro. Um, if you could have one billboard anywhere, anywhere in the world, let, let's say in the US, what would it say? Uh, what would it say and where would you put it? Oh man, what would it say? Ah, that's a tough one. I would say let's uh just off the top of my head, let's um do what do the best you can for the next guy. So he can do it for the guy next to him. Or for the next person, so they can do it for the person next to them. Okay. Right? And yeah. the way I look at that is, you know, on the field, I always, you know tell any player if you can do 100% of your job and 50% of the other the guys around you that team will be unbreakable and if everybody does that that team will be unbreakable so just kind of that's kind of direction you know mm-hmm. 100% of your job 50% of the person next to you yeah. and i put that in times square for sure i love that <laughs> i love that big audience there um if you could go back to yourself at any age you wanted to and give yourself the wisdom you have today at 32, what age would you go to and what would you tell yourself? Man, I would go back, you know, I think I would go back to, to age 12, man. When I, when I made the decision that this is what I want to do for the, for the rest of my life, I would go back to that age and I would tell myself to don't be afraid to ask questions. Right. Don't be afraid to ask questions to the people that you see are doing something that are on the level that you want to do it at. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the biggest thing for me as a young, young player. Right. Is like kind of getting intimidated like, man, that guy or that coach or that one, man, they're doing this thing at such a high level and I'm not quite there yet. I'm just going to go sneak a peek and try to copy what they're doing when it, instead I could just go ask. Right. Hey, you mind showing me, blah, blah, how do you do this? How do you do that? And they can actually explain it to me and I can, you know, save myself. The right information um, 
I forgot what the, the – so our assistant coach, you know, he showed us this statistic. The right information can accelerate learning by, like, eight months, mm. you know. And so maybe going to talk, and talk to somebody and, hey, can you mind showing me or telling me how to do that? They actually give you the steps and the blueprint. Wow. Instead of trying to figure it out yourself and not knowing what to do, which is good, right, to figure it out and make the mistakes, blah, blah, blah. But if you actually have the information and the pathway – accelerate your learning and then you can move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing quicker so i would go back to 12 when i fell in love with the game and i would give my that's what i would tell myself ask questions to the people that are doing things at a level that you want to do it at no man i i love that that's uh, i haven't heard you know haven't heard that so direct before and i could relate to that myself like for example some younger players on my team like i just say to them like why don't you ask me you know just ask me the question mm -hmm. you know i mean ask it earlier because I would love to give the information. I'm not the guy that's going to go tell them, do this, do that. Like, if they ask, I'll tell them. But I'm not going right. to You know, I like to lead by example and things like that and not to talk more with my actions and my words. But sometimes mm -hmm. I, they, they, they say something. I'm like, why didn't you ask me earlier? I, I would have loved to help you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And not everybody wants information as well, right? And so it's you can't read everybody's mind. So, I mean, if somebody comes and acts and you give it, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. So ask questions, man. There's no the high performing people ask questions, you know. So ask more questions. 100. I love that. Um, and th then I wanted to ask you, you know, I'm gonna have a, another guest on next week. If you could ask them a question, what is a question that you you would like to ask the next guest that they could answer uh, for the audience? Yeah, I would ask them. I would ask them a twofold question. What what has been the big what has been the biggest lesson that they've learned so far being a pro and what is something that they uh that they the biggest challenge that they've had right so and it could be the same answer you know what 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 have they what's been the biggest lesson they learned and what's the biggest challenge that they've faced as a pro and how did they overcome it so i guess a threefold question okay so let, let's finish that the podcast off with that because that's a great question for yourself I mean, we've, we've heard, you know, what, what your, your, your journey, your obstacles, your highs and lows, but just to finish, because I love, that's a great question. Just if you could, you know, finish that off yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I would, the biggest lesson I've learned, man, so far as a pro is that, and we've, we've been saying it over and over, you know, it's all up to you and it's all in your control, right? Not all of it, right? Because some things you can't, you can't, you know, control. But at the end of the day, you can control your effort. You can control your decision making, right? The choices you make and you can control your attitude. So I would say the biggest lessons I've, I've learned is that if you just show up with the right mindset, right? And the right attitude, and you come with a plan to make a little bit of progress each time, right? And you stick with that plan. It's going to, it's going to, I mean, years down the road, months and years down the road, you're going to be in a much better place than if you just come and you try to be the next Ronaldo or Messi in one session, right? So I would say just come with the mind, with the right mindset, the right attitude of just doing the simple things well consistently and just add that up day by day by day. And, you know, in a few months, years, you're going to be in a way better place, right, than, than you would with, with, with otherwise. Mm -hmm. so that's the biggest lesson the biggest challenge that i face um obviously was my time in st louis when you know it was supposed to be at the height of my career and um you know it all got taken away got humbled by the game that's the biggest challenge and the way that i overcame that was just by asking questions right asking questions to my therapist and the different people around in my support system and then actually not just getting the information just to get it because there's information available to everybody, right? But actually applying the information and applying the different things to my game, right? And to my routine and to my life. And that's 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 how I overcame that that tough time. That's class, Rishi, bro. I, I really appreciate you coming on, man. It's it's been a fantastic conversation, and I know people are gonna learn a lot from this one. And uh man, I wish you the best of luck with with your playing career and uh, with coaching. I know you're going to be a fantastic coach. So yeah, man, uh, really appreciate it and uh, kill it the rest of the season and then go enjoy that sensory deprivation tag, man. Yes, sir. Hey, listen, I appreciate you, man. And I uh, just want to say, you know, while we're on the record, Hey, 
like I said before, there's not many pros out there. There's not many, actually not many people in the industry that actually, you know, say it for what it is. Right. Yeah. And, and you, t you, there's a, there's a perception of being what being a pro is. And then there's the reality. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just applaud you, man, for what you've been doing with your platform. Right. Not just sharing the information and, 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 and helping people, but actually, you know, painting the picture of what it really is like to be a pro and to be a footballer, you know, uh, performing at a high level and a, a, a aspiring young player that's trying to get to the next level. So continue to do what you're doing, man. Um, you're headed, you're helping a lot of people. And I wish I had this right here when I was a young player, you know. And so the fact that, you know, players are able to log on and, you know, what we're going to hour and a half, you know, see almost 90 minutes of, you know, a whole pro journey and uh, different advice and tips. It's uh, it, it's great, man. And, and I love what you're doing and continue to keep up the good work, brother. I appreciate it a lot, man. I really, it means a lot coming from you. So thank you, man. Thank you. Hey, my bro. We'll connect soon. All right. I appreciate, appreciate you. Take Stay care. Healthy, man. Peace Thanks, out, bro. Bye-bye.